All right, this is chapter six, lifting and moving patients. Your National EMS Education Standard Competencies, of course, is to prepare you to apply the fundamental knowledge of the EMS system, safety and well-being of the advanced EMT, medical, legal and ethical issues to the provision of emergency care. This is really um, going to focus on workforce safety and wellness as far as lifting and moving patients. In the course of a call, you will have to move patients several times to provide medical care in the field and transport patients to the emergency room. Often you'll have to move a patient into a different position or location. You will likely involve the use of a stretcher, backboard, or other device. Once you have assessed the patient and provided emergency care, you and your team may have to move the patient from the scene to the ambulance and then again from the ambulance to the hospital bed. To avoid injury to the patient, yourself, and your partner, you will have to learn how to lift and carry the patient properly and safely. You will need to know how to perform emergency body drags and lifts, rapidly move a patient from a car onto the stretcher, assist a patient from a chair or bed onto the stretcher, lift a patient from the floor onto the stretcher, carry a patient up or down stairs, place a patient with a suspected spinal injury onto a long backboard, package patients with and without suspected spinal injuries, lift and move patients with special needs, such as those who weigh more than 300 pounds, and lift and move patients in a variety of environments, such as on a trail. Lifting and carrying are dynamic processes to ensure no person suddenly bears unexpected dangerous weight and to reduce the risk of injury to a provider or a patient, you must know where all providers should be positioned, how to give and receive lifting commands so that all parties act simultaneously, and how to prepare patient moving devices such as a wheeled ambulance stretcher, also called an ambulance stretcher, gurney, or simply the stretcher or cot. A stair chair, backboard, scoop stretchers, folding ambulance stretchers, basket stretchers, and flexible stretchers. You'll need to know when and how to use patient moving devices. Training and practice are required to use all the equipment that is described in this chapter. You must master the skills necessary to use each device and understand its advantages and limitations. Practice each technique with your team often so you can perform the move quickly, safely, and efficiently. Maintain your equipment according to the manufacturer's instructions. Um, I will tell you that I do know there are registry questions that describe a patient's location and you have to identify which one of these devices um, you should use to properly move this patient. Anatomy review. Um, proper body mechanics should remain a paramount. When a person is standing upright, the weight of anything being lifted and carried in the hands is reflected onto the shoulder, shoulder girdle, the rib cage, the spinal column inferior to it, the pelvis, and then the legs. The shoulder girdle rests on the rib cage supported by the vertebrae that lie inferior to it. So this is here it is the whole system not just the shoulder it's the whole system arms are connected to and hang from the shoulder girdle i hope you know what arms are uh, the sacrum uh, is the mechanical weight bearing base of the spinal column okay and um, here is the entire spinal column and then the sacrum are your fused vertebrae that are here um, it is the fused central posterior section of the pelvic girdle. In lifting, the shoulder girdle is aligned over the pelvis. Hands are close to the body. Force exerted against the spine occurs in an essentially straight line down the strong stacked vertebrae in the spinal column. With the back properly maintained in the upright position, little strain occurs against the muscles and ligaments that keep the spinal column in alignment. Significant weight can be lifted and carried without injury to the back. 
The first key rule of lifting is to keep the back in a straight, upright, vertical position and to lift without twisting or bending. You lift using your legs. You may injure your back if you lift with your back. Um, if your back is curved or straight, that bent significantly forward at the hips. When lifting with your back in the improper position, the shoulder girdle lies significantly anterior to the pelvis. The force of lifting is exerted primarily across the spinal column. The weight is supported by the muscles of the back and ligaments that run from the base of the skull to the pelvis, keeping the spinal column in alignment. The upper spine and torso serve as a lever so that the force that is exerted against the muscles and ligaments in the lumbar and sacral regions is many times that of the combined weight of your upper body and the object you are lifting. This is not okay. Proper lifting techniques. Legs should be spread about 15 inches apart or shoulder width. Place your feet so that the center of your gravity is properly balanced between them. With your back held upright, bring your upper body down by bending the legs. Properly grasp the patient or stretcher. Make any necessary adjustments in the location of your feet. Lift the patient by straightening your legs and raising your upper body and arms until you are again standing. Your arms should still be extended. The safest and most powerful way to lift um, this is called a power, power lift. Um, you curl your forearms if you need to lift higher. Do not lift a patient or heavy object with your arms outstretched. This will cause the same adverse force as if your back were not properly upright. Hold your arms so that your elbows are aligned with the sides of your body. Keep the weight you are lifting as close to your body as possible. Avoid placing lateral force against the spine and sideways leverage against the lower back. Keep your arms approximately the same distance apart as when hanging at each side of the body with the weight distributed equally and properly centered between them. If necessary, turn your body and or move to the left or right until the weight is properly balanced and centered. To lift safely and produce the maximal power lift, follow the steps in Skill Drill 6-1. Reverse these steps whenever you are lowering the stretcher and always avoid bending at the waist. Proper hold. If you do not have proper hold of the stretcher or of the patient in a body lift, you will not be able to bear a proper share of the weight there is an increased chance that you can suddenly use your grasp. If this happens, your team members may sustain back injuries. Use the power grip to get the maximum force from your hands whenever you're lifting a patient. To perform a power grip, face your palms up, keep your hands at least 10 inches apart. Insert each hand under the handle with the palm facing up and the thumb extended upward. Advance the hand until the thumb prevents further insertion. Uh, a cylind cylindrical, cylindrical, say that again, cylindrical um, handle, it's a handle in the shape of a cylinder, y'all, um, lies firmly in the crease of the curved palm. Curl your fingers and thumb tightly over the top of the handle. All fingers should be at the same angle. Fully support the underside of the handle with your curved palm with only the fingers and the thumb preventing it from being pulled out of the palm. Um, basically, y'all lift from the bottom of the cot. Like, put your hands under the handles and wrap your fingers and your thumb around it. I have seen some people grab it from the top. What do you think happens if you lose your grip, if your hands are sweaty, if your gloves rip, blah, blah, blah. Um, do you think you're going to be able to balance and regain control of that stretcher and the weight that's on that stretcher if you're holding it from the top? No, you need to be holding it from underneath. The power grip will help you lift an object higher if necessary once you have lifted by extending your legs. Curl by using your biceps to flex the arms while maintaining the power grip. 
Never grasp a stretcher or backboard with the hand placed palm down over the handle. This causes the weight to be supported by your fingers rather than your palm and it is easier to lose your grasp. To lift a patient by a sheet or blanket, center the patient, tightly roll up excess fabric on the sides. Use that, so, there's that word again, <laughs> cylindrical handle to grasp the fabric and lift the patient. It is crucial the sheet be kept as taut as possible. Taut, that means tight. Um, you pull out all the stretch, get the stretch out. Directions and commands. Team actions must be coordinated. The team leader indicates where each team member should be, rapidly describes the sequence of steps to perform before lifting. Um, orders that will indicate um, that lifting should be initiated or moving or any significant change in movement should be given in two parts, a preparatory command and a command of execution. Examples are, team leader says, all ready to stop. Get the team's attention, identify who should act, and prepare them to act. Then the team leader says, stop indicates the exact moment of execution delivered in a louder voice. Countdowns are often used to lift a patient. To avoid confusion, always clarify if three is part of the preparatory command or whether it is to serve as the order to execute. Examples, we are going to lift on three, one, two, three, or I'm going to count to three and then we're going to lift, one, two, three, lift. Um, when you use a body drag, the same principles apply as when lifting and carrying. Keep the back locked by tightening the abdominal muscles, not curved or bent laterally. Avoid any twisting so that the vertebrae remain in normal alignment. When reaching overhead, avoid hyperextending your back. When pulling a patient on the ground, kneel to minimize the distance you will have to lean over. Reach forward and grasp the patient so that your elbows are just beyond the anterior part of the torso. When pulling a patient who is at a different height from you, bend your knees until your hips are just below the height of the plane across which you will be pulling the patient. During pulling, extend your arms no more than about 15 to 20 inches in front of your torso. Um, Y'all should be looking very funny right now. Like as these are being described to you, oh, sorry. Um, as these are being described to you and um, you're trying to picture this in your head, get in these positions. Um, stand and put your feet, you know, 15 inches apart, shoulder width apart. Um, practice squatting and kneeling and reaching and put your body in the position that I'm trying to describe to you so that it will help you better understand. When you're sitting trying to think in your head and move this imaginary person around in your head, um, some of this might not make sense. Um, and I know that these words can become very boring and it's easy to lose focus. So if you concentrate on this and actually act it out as we're going through it, it's also going to help you stay focused. Um, so get up, move around, do this stuff. All right, this figure shows reaching and pulling safely. Kneel to pull a patient who is on the ground. When pulling, your elbows should only extend just beyond the anterior torso. Bend your knees to pull a patient who is at a different height than you are and position your feet or knees to balance the force of the pull. Repositioning your feet or knees if kneeling so that the force of the pull will equally be balanced and centered. Pull the patient by slowly flexing your arms. When your hands can reach the front of your torso, stop and move back another 15 to 20 inches. When properly positioned, repeat the steps. Alternate between pulling the patient by flexing your arms and repositioning yourself. Avoid situations that involve strenuous effort lasting more than one minute. Moving a patient across a bed. Kneel on the bed to avoid reaching beyond the recommended distance. 
Follow the steps for a body drag until the patient is within 15 to 20 inches of the bed's edge. Complete the drag while standing at the side of the bed. Use the sheet or blanket to drag the patient. You can roll the bedding under the patient until it is about 6 inches wider than the patient. Pull on the rolled bedding smoothly and evenly to glide the patient to the bedside. Be on the lookout for soiled sheets. Use proper protective equipment as needed. Unless the patient is on a backboard, transfer the patient from the stretcher to the bed in the emergency room or the patient's hospital room with a body drag. The stretcher should be the same height as the bed and held firmly against its side. If you and a partner should kneel on the bed and drag in increments until the patient is centered. When transferring a patient onto a narrow examining table, you should usually drag the patient while standing against the opposite side. A third person may need to take both sides of the draw sheet at the head to move the patient safely. A two-person body drag. During a body drag, you and another provider may have to pull the patient with one of you on each side of the patient. After the usual pulling technique to prevent pulling sideways and producing adverse lateral leverage against your lower back, follow these steps in skill drill 6-2 to perform a two-person body drag. So y'all, this is going to be equivalent to um, when you move the patient over to the hospital bed or when you move them to the cot from the bed and they're too far down and you have to pull them up towards the head of the cot or the head of the bed. Um, that's what this is describing here is a two-person body drag. Um, log rolling a patient. Generally, you will initially need to reach further than 18 inches. Kneel as close to the patient's side as possible to minimize this distance. Leave only enough room so your knees won't prevent the patient from being rolled. When you lean forward, keep your back straight. Lean slightly from the hips. Use your shoulder muscles to help with the roll. Roll the patient without stopping until the patient is resting on his or her side. Some experts believe you should push rather than pull during a log roll. Follow local protocol. Um, Y'all, I've seen this on tests before, um, specifically log rolling a patient. Um, so make sure you're really paying attention to this stuff. Rolling a wheeled ambulance stretcher. Um, you do this every day. Rolling a wheeled ambulance stretcher, most commonly used device to move and transport patients. Ensure it is in a fully elevated position. If you are guiding the stretcher from the foot end, hold your arms close to your body. Avoid reaching significantly behind you or hyperextending your back. Your back should be locked straight and untwisted. While you are walking and pulling the stretcher, bend slightly forward at the hips. Your legs are pulled back with the feet on the ground. Your pelvis is moved forward. Try to keep the line of the pull through the center of your body by bending your knees. A second advanced EMT should guide the head in, assist you by pushing with his or her arms positioned so the elbows are bent and the hands are about 15 to, sorry, 12 to 15 inches in front of the torso. Never push an object with your arms fully extended in a straight line and the elbows locked. Push from the area of your body that is between the waist and the shoulder. If the weight you are pushing is lower than your waist, push from a kneeling position. Move forward little by little as needed to stay close to the patient. Do not push or pull from an overhead position. Whenever possible, use a device that can be rolled to move a patient. Um, this is going to be for a patient on a backboard stretcher. Pull the foot in while your partner guides it from the head end. When a wheel device is not available, make sure that you understand and follow certain guidelines for carrying a patient on a stretcher. Refer to Table 6-1 for guidelines. When a stretcher must be carried, it is best if four providers are available to carry it. There's more stability and it requires less strength. One advanced EMT should be positioned at each corner of the stretcher. This is much safer if the stretcher must be moved over rough ground. In a two-person carry, the two advanced EMTs should stand facing each other with one person at the head end of the stretcher and the other at the foot end. One advanced EMT will need to walk backwards. If the patient is supine on the backboard or is lying in a semi-fowler's position on the stretcher, 
more of the patient's weight rests on the head half of the device than on the foot half. Use the correct lifting techniques. If possible, all team members should be of the same approximate height and strength. Weight and distribution. Estimate the patient's weight before attempting to lift him or her. Adults often weigh between 120 and 220 pounds. Two advanced EMTs should be able to safely lift this weight. Depending on individual strength, you may be able to lift more. However, try to use four rescuers whenever available resources allow. Know how much you can comfortably and safely lift. If lifting a, pa a patient places strain on you, call for lifting to stop and lower the patient. Communicate clearly and frequently with other rescuers when lifting a patient. Do not attempt to lift a patient over 250 pounds with fewer than four rescuers, regardless of individual strength. Protocols should include a way to rapidly summon help or provide and maintain necessary care in the field. Know the weight limitations of the equipment you are using and how to handle patients who exceed those limitations. Special bariatric techniques, equipment, and resources are generally required to move patients over 350 pounds. Summon resources as soon as possible. More than one half of a patient's weight is distributed to the head end or the backboard of the stretcher. Place the strongest advanced EMTs at the head end. Carrying a patient up and down stairs. Proportionally greater weight will be distributed to the advanced EMT who is carrying the foot end when the backboard or stretcher becomes angled on the incline. Ensure the two strongest advanced EMTs are positioned at the head and the foot end of the device. If you believe you're approaching maximum capacity, do not attempt to lift or carry the patient a significant distance or down a flight of stairs. Attempt again after you have decreased the amount of proportional weight you're carrying by either changing your position or changing the position of others on the team or obtaining additional help. Um, so let's talk about this before we move on. Um, this is saying that proportionally greater, greater weight will be distributed to the advanced EMT who is carrying the foot end when the back border stretcher becomes angled on the incline. Um, so in this case, the foot end doesn't necessarily mean the foot of the stretcher, the end that's coming down first the weight is going to shift in that direction because it is angled downward. Um, so that's going to be the heaviest end. Um, I always say to bring the head of the clock down first, even though the head already has the most weight and you're going to have even more weight shifted um, when you do this. The reasoning is, um, like we said, most patients are going to be transported in a Fowler's or semi-Fowler's position. So if you have this patient um, who is sitting in an almost upright position and you're carrying them down the steps feet first, that weight is shifting and there's nothing there to stop them from sliding towards the foot. And that's just a dangerous situation. If the head of the cot is angled up um, and you're carrying them down head first, then you have a brace there support to kind of catch that weight and keep it in place. Um, so uh, it just makes more sense to me that way. It's safer to do it that way. Okay. Planning the move. Move the patient in an orderly, planned, directed, and unhurried manner. Protect both you and the patient from further injury. This reduces the risk of worsening the patient's condition when he or she is moved. Generally, at a minimum, you will have to lift and carry the patient to a wheeled ambulance stretcher. Move the stretcher and the patient to the ambulance. Load the stretcher into the patient compartment. Additional steps may be necessary to place the patient onto a backboard, reposition advanced EMTs and carry the patient down flights of stairs. This usually requires lowering the backboard to the ground and lifting it again when the advanced EMTs are in their proper places. Um, assist, 
assist or lift the patient from a stair chair to a stretcher, you need to plan ahead. Select methods that involve the least lifting and carrying. Share any issues that may result in injury with anyone involved in the move. Um, if you see somebody doing something unsafe, tell them, you know, hey, um, that's not safe. Um, always talk to your partner, communicate with your partner, make sure that you're both on the same page as far as how you're going to do this, who's going to do what part. Um, work smarter, not harder. Okay. A diamond carry. This is used to lift and carry a patient on a backboard or stretcher. There are four rescuers, one at the head of the device, one at the foot, and one on each side of the patient's torso. Um, to perform the diamond carry, you're going to follow the steps in skill drill 6-3. If you must carry a patient through a narrow doorway or hallway, you will need to modify your positions. Stop and have all the advanced EMTs turn until each is facing again towards the patient. Take small, slow steps to move through the doorway. If the doorway is still too narrow, one provider may need to let go and move through the doorway first. The remaining three providers carry the backboard, but may need to alter their positions before the fourth lets go. The fourth provider steadies and guides the first advanced EMT as he or she moves through the passage. The patient on the backboard or the stretcher should be carried feet first. This puts the lightest load on the advanced EMT who must turn and grasp the handles with his or her back to the device in order to walk forward. This allows the conscious patient to see in the direction of movement. Why do we do that? Um, if they're conscious and you're pulling them through doorways and through halls um, and things like that, them going backwards could make them dizzy and sick. Um, it causes vertigo. One-handed carrying technique. One method of lifting and carrying a patient on a backboard. This is for four more advanced EMTs. Each uses one hand to support the backboard so that they are able to face forward as they are walking. To perform the one-handed carrying technique, follow the steps in Skill Drill 6-4. Pick up and carry the backboard with your back in the locked in position. If you need to lean to either side to compensate for a weight imbalance, you may need additional assistance or you may need to reevaluate the carry. Emergency moves. These are used when there is a potential for danger before assessment and care is provided. Hazards such as the presence of fire, explosives, and hazardous materials. Inability to protect the patient from other hazards an inability to gain access to others in a vehicle who needs life-saving care. It's also used when you cannot properly assess the patient or provide immediate, potentially critical emergency care before the patient's, uh, or because of the patient's location or position. If you are alone, use a drag to pull the patient along the long axis of the body. One of your primary concerns is aggravating an existing spinal injury. It is impossible to remove a patient quickly from a vehicle while providing as much protection to the spine as you would give by using an immobilization device. Certain guidelines during the move will help avoid further injury to the patient. This is the whole life over limb um, thing. Move a patient on his or her back along the ground using one of the following methods. Pulling the patient's clothing in the neck and shoulder area. If the shirt has buttons, the top two should be undone to prevent choking the patient. If possible, place the patient on a blanket, coat, or other item that can be pulled. Rotate the patient's arms so that they are extended straight on the ground beyond his or her head. Grasp the wrist and with the arms elevated above the ground, drag the patient. Or place your arms under the patient's shoulders and through the armpits and while grasping the patient's arms, drag the patient backwards. If you are alone and must remove an unresponsive patient from a car, again, follow steps in skill drill 
Um, if the legs and feet do not clear the vehicle easily, slowly lower the patient until he or she is lying on his or her back next to the car. Clear the legs from the vehicle and use a long axis body drag to move the patient a safe distance from the vehicle. Um, so what do we mean by long axis body drag? I don't know if y'all might understand that. Um, notice in this picture, she's she's obviously pulling in this direction, okay? Um, obviously going to pull in this direction. You're gonna follow the flow of the body, okay? You're not gonna grab him by this arm and start coming this way with him. Does that make sense? Uh, she's not gonna wrap her arms around him and grab a hold of his wrist and start sidestepping the pulling this way. You're gonna follow the direction of the body. One person drags, carries, and lifts. And this uses one person techniques to move a patient only if potentially life-threatening danger exists and you are alone or your partner is moving a second patient simultaneously. This shows additional one person drags, carries, and lifts. And this is called the front cradle. This is a firefighter's drag. And this is a one person walking assist. Obviously, this is not, um, you're going to need the patient to be able to wrap their arms around you um, and hold on. Or if they're unresponsive, if you do have a means of securing their wrists there together um, and then wrapping their arms around your neck to pull them that way. This is a firefighter's carry. And this is a pack strap carry. Urgent moves. These are necessary when a patient requires immediate life-saving care, yet is unsafe um, environment. Extreme weather conditions may make an urgent move necessary. It may be necessary for a patient with altered level of consciousness, inadequate ventilation, or shock. Uh, when care cannot be rendered where the patient is currently located. Rapid extrication technique should be used when a patient is sitting in a vehicle and must be urgently moved. Using an extrication type vest or short backboard device to immobilize a seated patient with a suspected spinal injury could take six to eight minutes or more. With the rapid extrication technique, a patient can be moved from sitting in the vehicle to lying supine on a backboard in one minute or less. Table 6-2 describes the situations in which you should use a rapid extrication technique. There is a greater risk for spine movement. Use only if extreme urgency exists. This requires a team of three rescuers who are practiced in the procedure. The first provider is positioned at the back seat and applies inline support and stabilization of the patient's head and neck and always calls the moves. The second provider supports the torso and the third provider moves and supports the patient's legs. Follow the steps in skill drill 6-6 six, six when performing the rapid extrication technique. You may sometimes be able to rest the head end of the backboard on the stretcher while the patient is moved onto the backboard. Once the backboard and patient have been placed on the stretcher, begin life-saving treatment immediately. If you use this technique because the scene is dangerous, immediately move the stretcher to a safe distance before you assess or treat. The steps of the rapid extrication technique should be considered a general procedure to adapt as needed. Every situation will be different, a different car, a different patient, a different crew. You must be resourceful and adapt easily. All right, non-urgent moves. This is used when both the scene and the patient are stable. Carefully plan how to move the patient. Before attempting any move, the team leader must ensure that there are enough personnel, obstacles are identified and removed, the proper equipment is available, and the procedure and path to be followed is identified and discussed. Every team member is responsible for sharing any issues he or she may notice. Adapt procedures for lifting and carrying a patient to meet your needs on a case-by-case -case basis. 
um, that every team member is responsible for sharing any issues he or she may notice. That goes back to the um, safety is everybody's job. That makes sense. Um, direct ground lifts. These are used for patients with no suspected spinal injury who are found lying supine on the ground. It's used when the patient will need to be carried a distance to the stretcher. If you find the patient semi-prone or laying on his or her side, roll the patient onto his or her back first. Ideally performed by three advanced EMTs, but it can still be done with two. And to perform the ground, um, direct ground lift, follow the steps in skill drill six, seven. Extremity lifts are used for patients with no suspected extremity or spinal injuries who are supine or in a sitting position. It may be helpful when the patient is in a very narrow space because it does not require the advanced EMT to stand side by side. Coordinate your movements using direct verbal commands. To perform the extremity lift, you're going to follow the steps in your skill drill 6-8. You'll be less likely to injure yourself if you bend the hips and knees and use your legs for lifting. This position may be uncomfortable for the patient. Transfer moves. There are several ways to transfer the patient from a bed onto the stretcher. The direct carry method is used to transfer a supine patient from a bed to the stretcher. Um, to perform this method, um, you're going to use skill drill 6-9. The draw sheet method is used to move the patient from a bed onto a stretcher. To perform this method, see skill drill 6-10. Use the draw sheet method to move an unable patient whenever possible. Um, this is easier on the providers and the patient. Other carries include using a backboard. Place the backboard next to the patient. Use a log roll or slide to move the patient onto the backboard. Secure the patient. Lift and carry the backboard to the nearby prepared stretcher. Scoop, scoop stretchers. Um, insert the halves under each side of the patient or log roll the patient onto a scoop stretcher that is already locked together. Follow the steps in skill drill 611 to use a scoop stretcher. Assisting an able patient. Assist an able patient to the edge of the bed. Place the patient's legs over the side and help the patient to sit up. Move the stretcher so that its foot end touches the bed near the patient. Help the patient to stand and rotate so that he or she can sit down on the center of the stretcher. Lift the patient's legs and rotate them onto the stretcher while your partner lowers the torso onto the stretcher. If the patient is able, always assist him or her to avoid the unnecessary strain of lifting and carrying. To move a patient from the ground onto the stretcher, lift and carry the backboard to the stretcher. Use a log roll or long axis drag to place the patient onto a backboard and then lift and carry the backboard to the stretcher. Use a scoop stretcher, log roll the patient onto the blanket. Um, those are different methods you can use to move from the ground onto the stretcher. Um, to lift a patient from the ground using a blanket, you're going to follow the steps in skill drill 612. Um, transfer a patient who cannot assist you from a chair to a wheelchair using the steps in skill drill 613. Geriatric patients. Most patients transported by EMS are geriatric patients. For many older patients, an emergency trip to the hospital can be terrifying or disorienting. Physiologic changes that occur with aging require special attention from the advanced EMT. You're going to have skeletal changes. They have brittle bones or osteoporosis. They may have rigidity, um, spinal curvature, kyphosis, and scoliosis. Um, that's the humpback in the curb spine. Many patients cannot lie supine on a backboard without causing further injury. Care and creativity must be used in immobilizing patients with these conditions. Consult local protocols and be familiar with methods for padding voids. So this is kyphosis. Um, in case you didn't know, this is the hunchback. And then this is um, an extreme form of scoliosis. Um, you may have some patients that have scoliosis that you can't even look at their back and tell that it's really got any curves. And rigidity. What is rigidity? Um, that is when you have firmness, hardness, stiffness.
Skin changes. Delicate skin is prone to tears and bruises even during the simplest moves. Protect the elbows when carrying or moving through hallways. Fear. Um, you're going to allay the patient's fears with a sympathetic and compassionate approach. Slow down, explain, and anticipate. These actions will help you gain cooperation from the patient. Bariatrics. From 2011 through 2014, over one third of the adults in the United States were considered obese. Obesity rate um, has tripled compared to just one generation ago, and obesity has reached an epidem epidemic proportions in the United States. It's McDonald's fault. Um, bariatrics is the branch of medicine concerned with management, prevention, or control of obesity and allied diseases. This is a direct correlation between the degree of obesity and the frequency and severity of health problems. The larger the patient, the more likely he or she will need emergency treatment and transportation. This problem takes a toll on healthcare workers because back injuries account for the highest number of missed days of work, temporary disability, and permanent disability. Equipment is being produced with ever higher capacities. And this does not address the danger posed to the users of this equipment. Mechanical ambulance lifts are used in Europe, but they are not as common in the United States. Patient moving equipment. The wheeled ambulance stretcher, also known as the ambulance stretcher gurney or simply a stretcher or pot, can be rolled along the ground and weighs between 40 and 145 pounds. Generally, this is not taken up or downstairs or to other locations where the patient must be carried rather than rolled for any significant distance. Um, it's available in a number of different models, which may include different features. Be familiar with the features of the stretcher your ambulance carries before going on a call. Know the location of the controls that adjust and lock each feature and how each feature works. Stretchers have a specific head end and foot end. They have a strong horizontal rectangular tubular metal main frame to which all other parts are attached. Stretchers should be pulled, pushed, or lifted only by this main frame or its handles. Most models have a second tubular frame made up of three sections that is attached within or above the main frame. A metal plate is fastened to each of the three sections between its sides. This serves as the platform on which the stretcher mattress and patient are supported. The head section of the stretcher runs from the head end to near the center where the patient's hips will be. Hinges at the center allow the head end to be elevated and the patient's back to be positioned at any angle. Designed to be elevated or moved down only when a tilt control is purposely released. At all other times, the back will remain locked at the position in which it was placed. The frame and plates that lie from the hips to the foot end of the stretcher are divided into two hinge sections. This may be connected so that the foot end can be drawn in towards the knees. This is not found in all models. Retractable guardrails are attached along the central portion of the main frame at each side. They are lowered when a patient is being loaded onto or out of a stretcher. Once the patient has been properly placed on the stretcher, the handle is drawn up and locked in an elevated position perpendicular to the surface of the stretcher. Guardrails can only be lowered when the locking handle is released. The underside of the main frame of the stretcher is supported on a folding undercarriage. It is designed so that the stretcher can be adjusted to any height and it can be locked at any height. Permits providers to transfer the patient without lifting. The stretcher remains locked at its present height when the controls are not being activated. Most stretchers also require the main frame to be slightly lifted so that the undercarriage becomes unweighted before it will fold even if the control is pushed. Controls are located at the foot end and at one or both sides of most stretchers. Use the proper lifting mechanics to lift the wheeled ambulance stretcher. The mattress on a stretcher must be fluid resistant. Most patients are placed directly on the stretcher. Some patients will need to be secured to a backboard first. A patient with a suspected spinal injury, a patient with multi-system trauma, a patient who may need CPR, 
a patient who needs to be carried up or downstairs while supine. In these cases, both the backboard and the patient are secured to the stretcher. Bariatric stretchers. This is a specialized wheeled stretcher for overweight or obese patients. It's similar in design to the common wheeled stretcher with several differences. It has a wider patient surface area, a wider wheelbase, and some are equipped with optional features such as a tow package that allows for an ambulance mounted winch to assist in loading the patient into the ambulance, or a telescoping side lift handles allow for increased leverage when lifting the mul with multiple responders. Uh, most important feature is the increased weight lifting capacity. Typical stretchers are rated to a maximum weight of around 650 pounds. Bariatric stretchers are usually rated between 850 and 900 pounds. Pneumatic and electronic powered wheeled stretchers. They were developed to decrease the potential for back injuries to EMS providers. They are similar in appearance to conventional wheeled stretchers. Battery operated with electronic controls to raise and lower the undercarriage. One drawback is that the added controls and equipment increase the weight of the stretcher. These are typically 75 to 100 pounds. This created um, a hazard when transporting on uneven terrain or down one or two steps. They are heavier. Um, Loading the wheel stretcher into an ambulance. One advanced EMT must hold the main frame to ensure that it will not roll. Whenever a patient is on an elevated stretcher, ensure it is held firmly between two hands at all times so even if the patient moves, it will not tip. Retract the undercarriage if you are going down steps. The undercarriage can be kept in place if you are going over a small obstacle such as a curb or a single step. Leave the prepared stretcher at the top or bottom of the stairs if the patient is going up or down one or more flights of stairs. Use a backboard or stair chair to carry the patient to the waiting stretcher. To load the stretcher into an ambulance, follow the steps in Skill Drill 614. Clamps will hold the stretcher in place until they are released at the hospital. You can control them with a single handle. You can activate when standing on the ground at the open back doors of the ambulance. The stretcher is designed to be rolled on a regular flat surface. If the patient must be moved over an irregular surface, such as a lawn, you must lift and carry the stretcher. Um, and this is um, just examples of stretchers. This is what your generation has. This is what I started out with. Um, yeah, tell my age there. So, an IV pole is attached to many stretchers. This can be unfolded or extended above the mainframe to hold an IV bag while you move the stretcher to the ambulance. Some wheeled ambulance stretchers include a carrier to hold an electrocardiographic monitor or an automated external defibrillator and portable oxygen unit. If your model does not include these features, you will have to secure these devices to the top surface of the stretcher mattress. The extra wheels below the head end of the main frame of the stretcher are not featured on some stretchers. These stretchers are not self-loading. Lower it until the undercarriage is in its lowest retracted position. Then, with you and your partner at each side of the stretcher, lift it to the height of the floor of the ambulance and roll it onto the track that locks it into place. Table 6-3 shows the guidelines that you must follow to load the stretcher into the ambulance. Make sure there is significant lifting power um, or sufficient lifting power. Um, follow the manufacturer's directions for safe and proper use of the stretcher and make sure that all stretchers and patients are fully secured before the ambulance is moved. Portable folding stretchers. I, this is a stretcher with a strong rectangular tubular metal frame with rigid fabric stretched across it. It does not have a second multi-positioning frame or an adjustable undercarriage. Some models have two wheels that make it easier to move the loaded stretcher. The legs should not be used as handles. Some models can be folded in half for storage. 
This is used in areas that are difficult to reach or when a second patient must be transported on the squad bench. Weight, and uh, these weigh much less than wheel stretchers and do not have a bulky undercarriage. However, because most models do not have wheels, you and your team must support all of the patient's weight and any equipment along with the weight of the stretcher. Flexible stretchers. There are several types, including um, the SCAD, Reeves, and Navy stretcher. Um, this can be rolled up so that the stretcher becomes a smaller tubular package. It's excellent for storage and carrying. Consider this when you must carry equipment a considerable distance from the ambulance to the patient. These stretchers can form around the patient's side and do not extend beyond them. When extended, they are useful when moving a patient from or through a confined space. The sketch stretcher can be belayed or repelled by ropes and a most uncomfortable stretcher, but it provides excellent support and immobilization. You've heard those called um, reef sleeves, I'm sure. Backboards are long and flat rectangular boards made up of rigid material. They are about six to seven feet long, used to carry and immobilize patients with suspected spinal injury or other multiple traumas. They can also be used to move patients from awkward places. It's commonly used for patients who are found laying down. Parallel to the sides and ends of the board are long holes that serve as handles and allow straps to be used to secure and immobilize the patient. Most of these are made of plastic. There are some wooden models that may still be used in some places. If your service uses wooden backboards, follow infection control procedures before reusing. Where wooden backboards are no longer used, they are usually stored for availability in the event of a multiple casualty situation. Yes, um, my cat has something to say. Um, short backboards or half boards are used to mobilize the head, torso, and neck of a seated patient with a suspected spinal injury until the patient can be moved to a long backboard. Short boards are three to four feet long. Short wooden backboards have mostly been replaced with a vest type device. And this here is a Katie. Vacuum mattresses. And this is an alternative to the backboard. It is used especially for geriatric and pediatric patients. The patient is placed on the mattress and air is removed from the device. It fits snugly to the curvatures and contours to the body at, um, and limits pressure point tenderness. It provides a high degree of immobilization and comfort, reduces the risk of hypothermia. Padding may be used for tender areas, but is not required for most patients. It is imperative to maintain spinal mobilization while placing the patient on the device and to secure the patient properly once he or she is placed on the mattress. A vacuum mattress cannot be used on patients weighing 350 pounds or more. Basket stretchers. This is a rigid stretcher, also called a Stokes litter. Um, it is used to carry patients across uneven terrain from a remote location that is inaccessible by ambulance or other vehicle. If the patient has a suspected spinal injury, immobilize the patient to a backboard and place the backboard inside the basket stretcher. When you return to the ambulance, remove the patient and backboard from the basket stretcher and place him or her on the ambulance stretcher. This can be used to carry a patient across fields, rough terrain, or trails or on a toboggan, boat, or all-terrain vehicle. The design allows water to drain through the stretcher. Basket stretchers are made of plastic with an aluminum frame and have a full steel frame connected by woven wire mesh. It is very uncomfortable for the patient unless it is padded. It is also used for technical rope rescues and some water rescues. Not all basket stretchers are rated appropriate for each spe specialized rescue. Um, it will be determined by people with additional specialized training. This is a scoop stretcher. 
It is also called an orthopedic stretcher. It is designed to be split into two or four pieces. The pieces are fitted around the patient who is laying on the ground or a flat surface. The parts are then reconnected and the patient is lifted and put onto a long backboard or stretcher. It may be used for patients who have been struck by a motor vehicle. It is efficient, but both sides of the patient must be accessible to use a scoop stretcher. Pay special attention to the closure area beneath the patient so nothing is pinched. You must fully stabilize and secure the patient onto the scoop stretcher. You cannot slip a scoop stretcher under the long axis of the patient's body. Narrow, well-constructed, compact, and have excellent body support features. However, they are not adequate when used alone for standard immobilization. It has internal support, so it cannot be used for radiograph. The patient will need to be moved to a standard backboard. And um, what does that mean? That means that you cannot have x-rays done while on this. I'm sorry, I've got um, an email that I'm sure is not important. All right, moving on. Stair chairs. All right, these are lightweight folding chairs with a molded seat, adjustable safety straps, and fold out handles at both the head end and the foot end. It serves as, as an adjunct for moving a conscious patient up or down stairs to the ground floor to the waiting wheeled ambulance stretcher. Use this if the patient's condition allows him or her to be placed in a sitting position. Most models have rubber wheels in the back with casters in front so that they can roll and make turns along the floor. Ensure the wheeled ambulance stretcher is at the proper height. Follow the steps in skill drill 615 to use a stair chair. And always remember to keep your back in a locked in position and to flex at the hips, not the waist. All right, when moving a patient on stairs with a backboard, do not use a stair chair if the patient is unresponsive in cardiac arrest or must be moved in the spine position or must be immobilized. Secure the patient onto the backboard. Ensure that the patient is anatomically secured to the device so that he or she cannot slide significantly when the stretcher is at an angle. Ensure the strongest provider is positioned at the head end. If one of the two strongest providers is considerably taller than the other, it will be easier if the shorter provider is at the head end and the taller provider is at the foot end. Place both the backboard and the patient on the stretcher, then secure both to the stretcher with additional straps. To carry a patient on stairs on a backboard, follow the steps in Skill Drill 616. Neonatal Isolates this is used to safely transport a neonatal patient from one hospital to another, also referred to as an incubator. It keeps the neonatal patient warm with moistened air in a clean environment. So the air's moist in there. Um, it protects infants from noise, drafts, infection, and excess handling. An isolate can be placed directly on a wheeled ambulance stretcher and secured with seat belts. It can be freestanding and secured into the back of an ambulance in place where the standard stretcher would be. It's often used by advanced pediatric personnel and follow their directions when insisting. I assure you they know more about this than you do. Decontamination. It is essential that you decontaminate equipment after each use to prevent the spread of disease. Know and follow your local standard operating procedures for disinfecting equipment. Patient positioning. Ensure a patient is properly positioned based on the chief complaint. Um, patients with a potential spinal injury should be fully immobilized. Patients with no suspected injury who report chest pain or respiratory distress should be placed in a position of comfort, typically a Fowler's or semi-Fowler's position. Patients who are in shock should be packaged and placed in a supine position. Patients in the third 
trimester of pregnancy should be positioned and transported on their left side if they are uncomfortable or hypotensive when supine. Why is that? So this is because um, your inferior and superior vena cava run along the right side of the body. So, um, and those are what, if you remember from tracing the drop of blood through the heart, that's where the blood returns from the body back to the heart. Um, so, these babies in the third trimester, these are big babies. These are like six, seven, eight, nine pounds. If you've got gestational diabetes, they may even be 10 or 11 pounds. So, if the patient is laying on their right side, the baby is shifting to the right side and it will put pressure on their vena cava, um, which not only causes pain, but it can also um, cause their blood pressure to elevate because um, the blood's having to push harder and work harder to get back to the heart because the baby is literally laying on the vena cava. So um, if they're uncomfortable, uh, if their blood pressure is elevated, you want these patients on their left side. That's going to shift the baby to the left. It's going to take the pressure off the vena cava, and it's going to hopefully decrease the blood pressure. Just a little FYI. Um, I like FYIs. Also, for another FYI, um, if you are wondering what all of the things that I was writing um, on chapter five's lecture, um, I asked you a question. If you were paying attention, if you watched it and you were paying attention and you noticed on the slides, um, there was a question. And the answer to that question is, Um, I think it's hilarious. Um, I want to know if you get it. Okay, moving on. You're going to place an unresponsive patient with no suspected spinal hip or pelvic injury into the recovery position. Um, we discussed this earlier. Um, patient laying on their left side. Um, with their head resting on their outstretched arm, you're going to use the right arm to kind of brace them um, to hold them up with that elbow, uh, and you're going to have that knee bent um, to kind of keep them from rolling over, kind of props them in place. That again was the left lateral recumbent um, or the recovery position. You're going to transport a patient who is nauseated or vomiting in a position of comfort, but ensure that you are positioned properly to manage the maintain the patient's airway. Um, these patients can aspirate. Pay particular attention to ensure you maintain the dignity of obese patients. Um, guys, don't make comments, don't huff and puff, um, don't tell jokes. Make sure that you protect their modesty, you keep them covered. Um, don't grunt and make sounds when you're lifting and loading these patients. Um, very, very unprofessional. Okay. Medical restraints. All right. Um, these are not commonly used. First, you evaluate the patient for correctable causes of, of combativeness. Um, you're going to check for head injury, hypoxia, hypoglycemia. Then decide if the restraint's necessary. There may be legal consequences for applying restraints or failing to restrain a patient who should have been restrained. 
follow your local protocols, obtain medical control authorization if necessary. FYI, in Alabama, it is necessary. The decision to restrain a patient should not be taken lightly. Restraints should be considered if the patient is posing a danger to you, your crew, himself or herself, or to bystanders. Before you attempt to restrain a patient, speak to the patient in a calming manner while remaining firm in your requests. If that does not work, a plan should be developed among all responders as to who will do what, when it will happen, and how you will accomplish the restraint. Restraint requires a minimum of five personnel, one for each extremity and one for the head. One advanced EMT should be the established team leader and give the commands. Um, you develop and agree on a plan to restrain the patient together. A patient who is caught off guard is less likely to cause injury to responders. The patient must be in the supine position when preparing um, to secure them on the stretcher. A patient in a prone position can develop positional asphyxia, um, which means that they can smother. This is preventable life-threatening emergencies. Each extremity should have a, huma a humane restraint applied to it, such as a triangle bandage, a roller gauze, or a soft commercially available disposable restraint or leather restraints. Preferably, the patient should be restrained on a backboard. If this is impractical, then secure the patient to the stretcher. And with either method, secure one arm above the patient's head and the other arm by his or her side. Why do you do that? You do that so that they can't wiggle and get their hands together and tie themselves. Um, secure the upper extremities first, then the lower extremities. Assess and continually reassess the patient's ABCDEs. Um, document your findings on the patient's care reports. Um, as with anything, um, any kind of immobilization, and this is considered an immobilization, you're going to check and make sure that they have um, a good uh, pulse motor um, sensory to the extremities after you restrain them. Uh, make sure you're not cutting off their circulation. And lastly, guys, um, personal considerations. Ask yourself these questions before moving a patient. Am I physically strong enough to lift and move this patient? Then you do your best to maintain a level, level of physical fitness. Um, ask yourself, is there adequate room to get the proper stance to lift the patient? And ask yourself, do I need additional personnel for lifting assistance? Remember, an injured rescuer cannot help anyone. Um, so that is going to be the end of Chapter 6. Um, I encourage you to go back and read um, all of your chapters. Go back over your lectures. Um, and as always, if you have any questions, reach out to us and I will see you in class.